Hi, I'm Kathleen Stone, Director of Curriculum and Instructional Design at Empire State College. And I am here with Kelly Herman, who is also at Empire State College. Hi, Kathleen. Um, as Kathleen said, I'm here at Empire State College. I'm the Director of Disability Services, and I've been here since 2005. I'm also involved with the Association on Higher Education and Disability, uh, and I co-chair the Special Interest Group on Online and Distance Education for the Association. Wonderful. Thank you, Kelly. My so pleasure. I have a first question for you. Sure. Why is it important to be proactive in course design, whether it's online or blended, or even face-to-face? Right, I, and I think that's a really important question, Kathleen, because we never know when a student with a disability is going to enroll in a course. And so sometimes those students do you know, come to our office and are proactive themselves and inform us that they need accommodations, but many other times they don't. And so we don't know what the student's needs are until you know, they come and they tell us. And if we don't, haven't taken the time to you know, work proactively and design the course so that we've considered accessibility, that student can be at a disadvantage because it'll, it may take us a couple of weeks to fix certain parts of the courses. So I think there are, th are things that we can do to, you know, kind of address accessibility, try to get to that one size fits most kind of model. It's not going to eliminate the need for individual accommodations, but certainly we, there are a lot of things that we can do to make it sure that the student has equal access from the second that they walk into the course, whether it's an online course, a hybrid course, or even an in-person course. You know, there are certain things and steps that we can take. And then the student also feels included from the get-go, and not that they, um, you know, are some kind of an anomaly, you know, that, you know, always has to ask for special consideration. I think that's a really important point. Mm -hmm. um, Often when I work with faculty, one of their concerns is their academic freedom. Right. So how would you advise faculty to uh, balance the needs of students and, and their academic freedom? Mm -hmm. And I think this is a, another really important question and one that comes up frequently when I'm working with faculty. You know, sometimes faculty think there has to be, you know, this, this balance, you know, this winner. You know, is it academic freedom or is it accessibility? And really, neither one can win, they both have to win, right? Mm -hmm. Because both are equally important. We need our faculty to have control over the academic content of their course because they are the content experts. Yet, the students also need to learn. And so, some of our students, there needs to be some considerations made for you know, their uh, disability-related needs, and we have to you know, look at accessibility. What I try to do when we're faced with a situation where a faculty member wants to use, let's say, some tool that they just learned about, and you know, it's really cool, it's kind of like you know, being a little kid on Christmas morning, and you've got this new toy, and you think it's gonna really help your students, so you wanna be able to use it. We wanna work with you to figure out how you can use that in a way that allows all students to access the material. So we talk through what are the ways that we can make this accessible? How are we gonna make it work? It really is a partnership, and I, I've been known to say, you know, it takes a village, you know, to ensure that our students have access, because it's not just the job of the Disability Services Office, it's not just the job of our instructional design staff, it's not just the role of the faculty member, it's all of us coming together and making sure that this faculty member can convey the content, the students can learn it, and that both, you know, have a good experience. I think I, that's a great point. You know, I, my experiences have also been working very collaboratively mm -hmm. with people to try to solve these sort of uh, problems. Right. So, um, could you talk a little bit about uh, the college's legal responsibilities sure. and what do we need to know as faculty or as staff about about the the legal aspects? Of course, um, I think you know the, the the federal law on this matter. You know, really, you know, comes down to we cannot discriminate against individuals with disabilities solely on the basis of their disability. So what does that mean for us? It means that all, all of our programs, all of our courses, all of the services that we provide to students, any activity that we sponsor has to be accessible to a student with a disability. So what does that mean? You know, th there's a lot of gray area in the law in terms of what we need to do on a technical and a technological level to ensure that our online courses and programs and activities are accessible to students with disabilities. But there are certain things that we do know. We do know that, you know, certain technologies like Flash don't usually work very well with a screen reader. So how can we work around that and try to get to a place where the student, you know, has access to that? The other piece of the law is that the federal government has really been paying a lot of attention to some of the advances in educational technology and has been saying, you know, wait a minute, there, there are certain things that you're using that are really cool and are going to enhance the learning opportunities for all students. 
except those who may use assistive technology. And I think you know the Kindle case that was wrapped up back in 2010 is one that most folks are aware of because it kind of set this ball in motion mm -hmm. of saying that pilot programs must be accessible. That you know the way in which that we accommodate an inaccessible technology has to be you know done in a substantially equivalent ease of use situation for that student with a disability as compared to the student without a disability so it really raised the bar a little bit for us on college campuses because we're we're required under section 504 because we accept federal financial aid and because we accept grant money we are required to meet those provisions and ensure that our programs are accessible for me it even goes beyond the law, right? You know, there, there's the, the written word of the law, then there's the spirit of the law. And when we talk about the spirit of the law, you know, as an educator, anything that we want to say to our, our students, we include that either in a lecture, or we include it in an, an online course, or we include it in an email, it's important. It's important to the content area, it's important to us, and we think it's important to our students. So why wouldn't we want our students to access it? Yeah, I think that's a really important point. Um, we really are looking at, at making sure we're serving all of our students, regardless of whether or not there's a law. Right. We want all of our students to be successful. Exactly. So if I, w if I was a faculty member or a staff member on a campus, though, that does not have a whole lot mm. of support uh, as far as a, you know, a, a dedicated office that knows something about online, for instance, right. what do I do? How, w how do I approach being, um, making sure that what I'm doing is accessible? Well, and I think th you know that that's that's a huge challenge, right? And I think even those of us who work in you know the disability services field, who you know kind of have a little bit of awareness and knowledge, also are like, what do I do? You know, and th you know there's a lot of gray area out there. So I think there are a couple of really good resources. Number one, I think you're doing a great job because you're in this course right now and watching this video. So you know that that's you know one way of being able to get some resources. I think you know also having a conversation with your disability services office and to say you know these are the concerns that I have. How can we work together to make this a campus-wide response and not just me as a faculty member and you as a disability services officer. You know, how can we work together to bring about awareness and get some more resources for our campus? I would love it if faculty would come to me and, and work, you know, be willing to work and partner with us in that way. There are also other you know, professional organizations you know, that sponsor conferences, webinars. You know, there are you know, different articles and listservs out there. You know, a great resource, as I mentioned earlier, is the Association on Higher Education and Disability, AHEAD. There's a lot of really great resources. There are also you know, other professional conferences that are dedicated just to assistive technology and accessible technology. Athen comes to mind. So I think you know, there are a lot of different ways that you can go out and research and learn more. The National Federation of the Blind has a lot of resources as well, particularly for those faculty who are working with students who are blind. Um, just to shift gears a little bit, sure. uh, as an instructional designer, one of the things that I'm able to do is use universal design for mm -hmm. learning when we're designing courses. Could you talk a little bit about the benefits of, of that approach? Sure, I'd love to. Um, I think when you look at universal design, you know, most of us, you know, can look around the environment that we're in. We can look at a door. You can see the lever door handle as opposed to the knob. You know, going to the airport, you know, you know you're pulling your suitcase behind you. You use the curb cut to be able to access, you know, the terminal. We've all used aspects of universal design in our built environment. Universal design is not about making things accessible. It's making things usable by the m most number of people possible. So it, while it often gets associated with disability concepts because it does benefit individuals with disabilities, it also benefits you know, all of our student population. So I think about the need for closed captioning. And I don't necessarily jump right to the student who has a hearing impairment. I think about the student who is a mom who works full time and has to wait until her kids are in bed in order to be able to do her schoolwork and to be able to watch that video with a low volume on but yet still get the content by watching the captions. So to me it's an approach that makes the education more available and usable by the most number of students possible. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, there's also some, and uh, we've talked a little bit about the laws, right? But there's also some very specific ones. So, mm -hmm. for example, the ADA. Correct. What's the benefit then for, for students, and, and even if they're not a student, for right. anybody with a disability mm -hmm. of, of the ADA? 
Uh, I think I guess we should say what the ADA is. Sure, mm -hmm. and it, absolutely. And the, the ADA is the Americans with Disabilities Act, and it was passed in 1990, and then um, went through an Amendments Act that was passed in 2008 that kind of brought some of the standards up to the times, um, at least you know current times, not necessarily in the technology world, but you know correcting some of the previous judicial decisions. So the Americans with Disabilities Act really has you know raised the awareness of what you know, it means to accommodate an individual with a disability. And I think has made it, you know, in the popular media especially, you know, that it's not something that's, com you know, someone's completely broken and, you know, they need a lot of fixes to be able to, you know, interact with the environment. That there are certain things that we should do so that they can fully participate in society. So I think all of us are more aware now of the, the need um, that some individuals with disabilities have. In higher education, I think it has opened up the doors for our students with disabilities to be able to access an education that they weren't previously able to access. You know, I talk to a lot of students, especially in the role that I play at Empire State College, who had tried college before and may have been in college before the ADA was passed and before 504 was you know, fully understood and implemented, who said, none of this was available to me then. And if it had been, I might have already been able to get my degree and not here now. And you know, it really is a, 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 you know, a journey for them and thinking through what could life could have been. And along with that, the advent of technology, you know, I think too, now that you know, some of these lawsuits have been filed, the main benefit of them is not necessarily the, the wins and the victory you know, or any you know, um, you know, financial gain that might be had, but also raising awareness on the corporate side. You know, the Amazon Kindle, as a result of that case, because it affected their marketplace, now is more accessible. We've had successful legal action you know, with Netflix about captioning of their streaming you know, movies and you know, for the individuals who are deaf. Those are all advancements that have been made possible because the ADA was passed in 1990 with really good bipartisan support and has been implemented really well. So I think the benefit is, is that it has, it has allowed our society to become more inclusive and so that you know, there are more opportunities for individuals to you know, seek out their education. I think the inclusive piece is a really important part. Mm -hmm. it, it's beneficial for all of us to right. have students and, and of all backgrounds in our courses. Absolutely, and I think you know, we also can think of disability as an aspect of diversity. Mm -hmm. you know, we talk about diversity in t sometimes in terms of the w lines in which we're born into. So we may be a certain race, we're a certain gender, you know, we may you know, you know, uh, subscribe to a certain religion. And, you know, but disability is the one protected class that all of us at some point in our life can join. You know, I work with a lot of students who, you know, had been working in construction, fell off a ladder, broke their back, no longer can work in construction, didn't think that college was for them. But now since their injury, you know, they need to do something different so that they can support their family and provide for themselves. So they're coming back to college. And the ADA and 504 make that possible. Yeah. Yeah. Great point. Yep. Mm -hmm. So is there anything that you would want faculty and staff to know um, in regards of working with students with disabilities? Sure. I think, um, you know, some of the things that I want to, you know, make sure that we highlight, you know, for our faculty and anyone who's taking this course in particular is that, you know, what we do in disability services and the accessibility is not meant to ensure that that student is successful. What it's meant to do is to ensure that student has the same access to the learning opportunities and the same opportunity to be successful as their non-disabled peers. And I think that's a really important point. You know, we are not talking about accommodations or accessibility as being a get out of jail free card. You know, it's not something that, you know, we're gonna absolve them of some of their responsibilities as a student, but rather it's going to make it possible so that they can fulfill their responsibilities as a student. And I think also, don't be afraid to ask, you know, and to ask for help, whether it's, you know, calling to the student directly and saying, how can I help you? You know, what else do you need from me as the instructor in order to mitigate the impact of your disability? Or going to your disability services office and saying, you know, I'm really committed to this. How else can I help? You know, what else can I do? I think those are really important things to take away. Yeah, I totally agree. Mm -hmm. yeah. So thank you so much for being with us today and for talking. These are really important things. Great. Well, thank you, Kathleen. I'm happy to be here. Oh, thank yeah. you.